I want to begin our time together by taking you somewhere in your imagination, some place that I've been, and it was a place that I never wanted to leave. I was on a tropical island, and I was admittedly getting bored. There was beautiful sunshine, white sand beaches, beautiful surf, but all my family wanted to do was just soak up the sun and sip fruity drinks. And that's just not me. I wanted to get up and do something. I wanted to go somewhere. And we happened to know a family on the island. And they had a bunch of little kids and their friends that were kind of hanging out with us. And these children, about seven of them, came to me. And they could see that I was just pacing the beach, wishing that I could go somewhere and do something. And they said, do you want us to take you to the coolest place on the island? And I said, yes, I do. Take me there. Where is it? And I followed these children to a big open mouth cave. And we began to walk down into the cave until it was so dark I couldn't see the children in front of me. I could hear their little feet in the gravel. And then they stopped. I looked back and I could see the lights at the opening of the cave behind me. But the children were silent now. Suddenly, just by listening, I could tell that they were grabbing handfuls of gravel and they began to throw it forward and I heard the gravel plopping in the water. Now it's dark, I didn't know water was there. And so we're standing there and then one of the kids says, now we get in. And I said to myself, I'm not getting in that dark water. But suddenly, plop, 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 splash, all of them were gone. And I could hear that they were swimming. And I said to myself, those little runts. I'm a grown man. If they can jump in that dark water, no, nah, I'm not jumping in that dark water. <laughs> But then I worked up the courage and I jumped in and I began to swim and then one of them said, keep going, keep going, and then I could hear them stop again. And I heard their little hands, their little wet hands slapping what sounded like a rock wall. Sure enough, I kept swimming and there was a cold wall in front of me. And then one of the little boys said, can you hold your breath? I mean, long. <laughs> and I said, I think I can hold my breath pretty long, longer than you. <laughs> and he said, because you're going to have to take a deep breath, because what we're doing now is you're going to take a deep breath, and then you're going to go down and down until you don't feel the stone wall anymore, and then you're going to swim forward as fast as you can. under the wall with no way up. I said to myself, there was a lot of self-talk going on during this event, I'm not going under there, and boom, they were gone. <laughs> so I took a deep breath and I submerged and I looked and I couldn't see anything except for maybe something way in the distance, and I just began to swim and swim and swim as fast as I could until I began to see their little feet in front of me, and then I saw them come up. And then as I was approaching, they were just treading water. And then I came up and took a breath of air, and I looked around me, and here were all these children busting up, laughing their heads off. And they were glowing a beautiful, iridescent blue color. And one of the boys said, it's the blue room. And we're blue! He was so excited about it. And I looked down and the water was so crystal clear and I was blue. And he said, look up. And I looked up and we were in an underwater cave. And there was an opening at the top. 
And the sunshine was coming in through that opening and refracting off the stone walls and the water so that everybody was shining blue. And they said, see you later, and they took off. <laughs> and there I was for a few moments just treading water in this beautiful underwater cave, this place, this beautiful place. And I'm meditating, and I'm thinking, and the thought comes to me, this, this is what God's heart is like. This is what God's heart is like. God's heart is the most beautiful place to discover. It, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of like C.S. Lewis had this thing he used to say quite a bit when he, as an atheist, finally came to faith and he got a glimpse of Jesus. C.S. Lewis used to say, higher up and deeper in. Higher up and deeper in. God's love is like that. Once you taste it, you can't get enough. Once you get in, you want deeper in, and you can't get enough. It's a kind of holy addiction, if you will. But when you're standing on the outside looking in, you're apprehensive. You gotta get on the inside of his heart, and then you begin to realize, wow, this is what I've been looking for all my life. This is the apex of reality. This is what I was made for. I was made to be loved like this, with a perfect quality of love. That's what God's heart is like. I threw out this text on Sabbath as a tease. It has been like true north for me over the years because I wasn't a believer. I didn't know anything about God. And there's no way that somebody could have simply quoted authoritative text to me in order to make me believe because the Bible meant nothing to me. I had never held one in my hands. And then my mother said to me one day after she had come to know the Lord, she knew that I loved music to an inordinate level that I poured over song lyrics as a teenager. And so my mom tricked me into getting into the Bible. She said, Ty, I've been reading the Bible and there's a bunch of song lyrics in there. I said, really, in the Bible? Song lyrics. So I began pouring over scripture, specifically the Psalms. And I read these words as a teenager. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Just pause right there, just pause right there. At that point, if you don't read on, you're thinking, what does David want? What is he after? What's the one thing? Is this a materialistic pursuit? Is he saying, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life because life's pretty good there? There's luxury, it's posh, it's incredible. There's streets of gold, pearly gates, mansions I've heard we'll have there. No sickness, no death. Is that what he's after? One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And, and here's what's driving him, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. That just means to ask questions, to probe, to process, to think, to feel. I wanna think and feel in God's temple. I wanna process reality through the paradigm that is his beauty. I wanna see the world and everyone in it. I wanna see myself, I wanna see others through the prism of God's love. God's beauty, that's all I want, David says. And so as a teenager, that's, that's what I began to want. I began to want it. Do you hear the word? I began to want it because beauty is attractive. 
religion tends to impose a sense of obligation. But something changes deep inside when we get a glimpse of the beauty of God's character. It so takes us in to the vortex of its goodness that we move from a sense of obligation to a sense of desire, to a sense of want. We move from I have to to I want to. And we find ourselves leaning into God, not out of a sense of duty, not out of a sense of I got to do this in order to get to heaven. I don't want to be lost. I want to be saved. After all, even the Adventist hell is bad. Think about it. So if my only concern is get me to the good place so I can avoid the bad place, then I'm going to be strapped with a sense of obligation, a sense of ought, a sense of must. But then there's, there's something about the beauty of God's character, like that blue room, that when you get inside, you just want more and more and more, and you realize that something has changed inside of you. Recently, I was getting a haircut, and it's therapeutic, I guess, they want to talk. So I'm sitting there getting a haircut, and she just starts asking me questions. What do you do? And I kind of dole out the information ever so slightly. You don't want to just sit there for the first time you're getting your hair. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, and I preach the gospel around the world, and oh, conversation stops. But she begins to pick up on something, and she says, so you believe in God? And I was just about to say, well, well, yeah, of course, don't you? Yes. And then I realized, wait a minute, if I say yes, I may be saying yes to something to which my answer really would be no, if I knew what she was thinking. There's a picture in her head that is attached to the word God. So I'm thinking, how do I respond to this? And suddenly, it just comes out, I say to the question, do you believe in God? Suddenly I find myself saying, well, actually, yes and no. And she says, well, I mean, yes or no. Come on, you either do or you don't, she says. And I say, no, actually, I'm the closest thing to an atheist as you can get and still believe in God. She's cocking her head and cutting too much off, and <laughs> I'm realizing that something's going on. Just imagine with me that uh, this box represents what people believe, what people think about God. Let's, in fact, let's just call it the God box, all right? And, and the God box is filled with all kinds of stuff. Have you noticed? It, it's filled with people who blow up abortion clinics in the name of God. It's filled with people who blow up themselves, for crying out loud, in the name of God, and in the process, blow up others. The God box is filled with people who believe that God will eternally torture people nonstop forever. Do you know how long it forever is? Just writhing in the flames of agony, floating to the surface of the flames every billion years or so and gasping one more hot breath of air only to sink down again and to feel torture. In the God box, there are people who believe that God is the ultimate micromanaging control freak. He predetermines who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost before we're ever born. That's what the girl who was cutting my hair believed, or actually didn't believe because she couldn't process it and therefore didn't believe in God. So God decides in eternity past who's going to make it and who's not going to make it we have no choice in the matter. Within the God box in the city I live in, in Eugene, 
Within the God box are people who walk around town wearing signs that say God hates, and you can only imagine the words that follow. God hates certain people groups. God hates certain individuals. There's all kinds of stuff in this box. And every person that we meet is thinking something, even in their unbelief. They're believing against something. They're not simply saying, I don't believe in God. They're saying, I don't believe in a very specific picture of God, a very specific conception of God. Great pens, Rodley. Too bad it's not St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> you probably have heard of Dr. Dr. Richard Dawkins. In his book, The God Delusion, he pretty much summarizes what a lot of people feel, and he simply says that the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant, notice the next word, the most unpleasant, what is that word? Character in all fiction. Of course, he believes the Bible is fiction. The most unpleasant character in all of fiction. He's forgot, of course, about Jack the Ripper and a number of others. But he's exaggerating for effect. And he's essentially saying that it's not about biology for me, even though he is an evolutionary biologist. But if you read The God Delusion, it's not page after page after page of biology. It's page after page after page of character talk. Talk about the kind of person he imagines God to be, and therefore he's positioning himself against that picture. Are you following me? He's saying, I don't believe in that, and that has a definition. He goes on in this statement to say that God is essentially a psychopath, that God is a racist, that God is what he calls a bully because God is in the business of just controlling people. But of course, then he says that couldn't possibly be. In other words, his thinking is something like this. If God is that diabolical, count me out. I don't believe in God. The biology in his book doesn't come till later. He just throws that in. Richard Dawkins is the foremost atheist on the planet, and he's essentially reacting against a picture of God that if we examine it, we might join with him and say, hey, Richard, we don't believe in that God either. To which he might respond by saying, well, is there another? Probably not. But the world is filled with this conception. This is just a sampling of some of the atheists that are vocal right now. This is Taylor Schillings. She's the star of the new television show, Orange is the New Black. And she says, listen to her thinking. She says, I cannot get behind a supreme being who weighs in on the Tony Awards or the Super Bowl, people thanking God for the win, Hear what she's saying. Standing to the mic, receiving the award, and saying, God gave me this. I cannot get behind some supreme being who weighs in on the Tony Awards while a million people get whacked with machetes. And you should be sitting there saying, she's onto something. Rather than going all kung fu apologetic on her, and trying to prove to her that a God exists that you find untenable as well. She goes on and she says, I don't believe that a billion Indians are going to hell. We're going to talk about that on one of the evenings, this, this idea that she's getting at, where she's saying, I can't believe in the existence of a God who will damn to hell everybody who lives in India simply because they were born there and all they know is Hinduism. That's what she's saying. I'm going to show you on a future evening a whole new way of processing how God saves people, and it includes Hindus. She says, I don't believe in that kind of God. 
I don't think that we get cancer to learn life lessons. She's responding here to a theological paradigm. She's responding to what's called determinism or Calvinism, where a person begins to suffer and the immediate theological construct is God has a plan. God's in this. In your cancer, she says, no, I don't believe that we get cancer to learn life lessons. And she goes on and she says, this is amazing, and I don't believe that people die young because God needs another angel. She's responding right there to a particular theological picture of God. Something was taught to her and she's responding to it. Are you following me? So she's an atheist. And we can either say, you ought not to be an atheist, Taylor. Or we could get shoulder to shoulder with her and say, oh my goodness, I'm so glad you realized that. Because there's a whole different way of processing and feeling and experiencing God. And what about this very popular actress? Gwyneth Paltrow says, religion is the cause of all the problems in the world. I think she's overstating her case here, but that is a characteristic of emotional reaction to ugliness. So she says religion is the cause of all the problems in the world. It causes war. More people have died because of religious conflict than any other reason. What are we going to do? Are we going to argue against that? Are we going to do a body count? Approximately, she's right. Yes or no? She is getting at something here, and it has produced unbelief in her because there's a picture that has been painted for her, and she's reacting against it. What is she reacting against here? What is at the core of what Gwen is reacting against? She's reacting against, watch this, she's reacting against violence. How about it? Would we agree against violence? Of course we do we would say amen to the atheist. And what about this guy? Brought up in American evangelicalism, Brad Pitt says, here's why I'm an atheist. He says, I was brought up being told that things were God's way. Everything that happens is the way God wants it to be. And when things didn't work out, it was God's plan. And there were people who suffered in his life that he loved. And, 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 and the people who believed in God told him, God's in this. God's plan is being worked out here. We're going to talk about that on a future time together. Just what part does God play in all the insanity going on in our world? He goes on, though, and he gets a little deeper. He says, I don't understand this idea of a God who says, you have to acknowledge me. You say, wait a minute, you're probably pushing back on that right now, but listen to what he says. You have to acknowledge me, this God is saying to him. You have to say that I'm the best. Then I'll give you eternal happiness. If you won't, then you don't get it. It seems to me, now he goes deep. It seems to me it's about ego, and I can't see God operating from ego. So it made no sense to me. You should be sitting there saying, he's on to something. Brad is. Maybe we don't see God operating from ego. Maybe we could say, Brad, there's a different paradigm, there's a different lens, there's a different picture of God that is completely free of ego. Maybe God is the epicenter of all perfect anti-ego love. Maybe God is against ego as the center of a person's ontology, as the center of his own ontology as God. Maybe God is against ego with Brad. Maybe he would come alongside Brad and give the nod and say, man, I'm sure glad you don't believe that about me. He goes on, though, and he gets at something that Taylor Schillings was getting at. He says, a big question for me was what? What's that word? Fairness. Do you believe in fairness? 
Let's just do a little quiz here. Raise your hand if you believe in God. Raise your hand if you believe in God. You don't have to believe in God right this minute. I'm going to try to persuade you, but okay. Raise your hand if you believe in fairness as a dimension of the divine character of the God you believe in. Of course. So Brad is saying here, a big question for me was fairness. Fairness in what sense, Brad? If, I'd, if I had grown up with some other religion, say Hinduism or Islam or Shintoism, whatever, if I had grown up with some other religion, would I get the same shot at heaven as the Christian gets? Do you hear what he's asking? Do you think God can bear a question like this? Do you think God wants us to ask questions like this? Can we have a conversation with this man? Or do we simply go into prove that God exists mode? And all the while, we don't even realize we're proving that a God exists that we don't even believe exists. And what about this guy, Mr. Bean himself? And he's not in a funny mood when he said this. He says, what is wrong with inciting intense dislike? of a religion if the activities or teachings of that religion are so outrageous, irrational, or abusive of human rights that they deserve to be intensely disliked. So what I'm saying to you is that there are all kinds of people, there are all kinds of people who reject the existence of God, let's just say it this way, they're rejecting the existence of God on moral grounds. Do you hear me? I reject the existence of God because I believe in fairness, because I believe in justice, because I believe in compassion. And the picture that they have received of God is void of those things. So the girl who's cutting my hair, she's like, what do you mean? You're an atheist. And I draw this God box for her in her imagination. And I simply say to her, what if, I mean, just what if, what if God is outside the God box over here with the people who want him to be better than what they've been taught to believe? What if God is truly eating with publicans and sinners? What if Jesus is associating with the people who feel the angst of bad religion and are asking for something beautiful? What I'm suggesting to you is that God is more beautiful than we or anybody has ever imagined. And skipping that text for the sake of time, Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus represents everything that is truly true about God. And getting into his thinking and into his feeling and into his patterns of relational action, observing Jesus in action is the revelation of God's character. Rather than arguing against atheism, maybe we should be affirming most of what the average atheist says he or she doesn't believe in. Maybe we should paint a new picture of God for the world and watch them in the discovery feel like they want to go higher up and deeper in. What if we completely changed the conversation from trying to intellectually prove what on second thought we really don't want to prove and throwing up a whole new canvas and dipping our brush in a whole new set of colors and just start painting for the world a picture of God that they would be glad to believe in because they believe in the kinds of things that we believe in